This is CBC Here and Now. Nate President Jerry Earle confirmed our greatest fears. There is no sunset clause in the tentative agreement. They want to privatize jobs for their own benefit, of course. I'm, I'm pretty much the grandma of the team. 24-year-old Katarina Roxon will swim in her third Commonwealth Games. He asked pizza lovers to improve his recipe, and now he can't keep up. And we only got two ovens. Uh, we're cooking as fast as we can. Well, lots on the go this weekend, including Hockey Day in Canada in Cornerbrook. We have some snow on the way for you folks along the West Coast and, in fact, all across the island. The details are coming up. Well, let's get to our top story, labor versus business. Government caught in the middle. A tentative collective agreement between the government and its largest public sector union isn't even ratified yet. Uh, but it's already in the crosshairs as NAEP squares off with the St. John's Board of Trade. Both groups came out swinging today over a no layoff clause in the deal. Here now is Terry Roberts has been following the developments and he joins us now live. So Terry, what's the latest on this story? Well, Anthony, we normally don't hear from a union when it's in the midst of a ratification vote. But NAEP broke with that tradition today. The union says it has no choice but to respond to what it calls fear-mongering by the Board of Trade. The president of NAEP says his union gave up a lot by agreeing to a full-on wage freeze. And in return, it wanted a guarantee that its ranks wouldn't be gutted. This is what this is about, that this budget coming... Uh, cards of frontline workers, members that we represent, won't be targeted with the budget. Earl says government can continue with its attrition plans and can make cuts if there's a proven lack of work. But he says the public service can't be targeted in order to bring down government's annual crippling deficits. So obviously this is not sitting well with the Board of Trade, Terry. What are the leaders there saying? Well, the board says this government is already borrowing two million every day just to keep the lights on, has the largest public sector workforce in the country. And today, Jerry Earl confirmed there's no sunset clause on this no layoff provision. The no layoff clause will be on the negotiating table at the next round of collective bargaining. This will give the union significant leverage as government will have to engage in concessionary bargaining in the next round of negotiations. Now, Keating says government is surrendering its ability to manage its financial affairs. She's been calling for a program review to see where efficiencies can be found. But Jerry Earle believes the Board of Trade has a different motive. They want to privatize jobs for their own benefit, of course, shutter public services, offices, facilities, schools, in rural Newfoundland, that is, and cut taxes for themselves. Now, what about Finance Minister Tom Osborne, Terry? Where does he fit into all of this? Well, yes, he threw a new twist on this today. He's leaving no doubt about where he sits on this debate. The Board of Trade have been absolutely irresponsible here. Uh, they're fear-mongering. It is dividing the community. Um, we have absolute certainty that this layoff clause does not roll over into the next agreement. I've given that assurance to the Board of Trade weeks ago. They continue to fearmonger. It's very unfortunate. We have an excellent deal. So we're talking zero wage increases, the elimination of severance, which will save the government $25 million a year, reduce benefits for new employees. Now that's new information. Workforce down 6% last year, oh, sorry, in the last two years through attrition. Now Osborne says that's much more effective than tossing hundreds of young public servants into the streets and grinding our economy to a standstill. Debbie? Thanks very much. That's our Terry Roberts reporting live for us this evening. And as Terry mentioned, the St. John's Board of Trade has come out guns blazing against this deal, and they went to a labor expert in Toronto to get his analysis of the agreement with its severance and layoff clauses. That expert, Howard, Le Howard Levitt, is blasting every bit of it. It's unbelievable how the government appears to have cratered and capitulated to the most outrageous set of demands I've ever even heard of in 40 years practicing labor law across this country. Howard Levitt has plenty more to say about the tentative deal, and we'll have that in about 15 minutes. 
Sentencing submissions wrapped up this morning for a shocking court case in St. John's. It involves sexting, an attempted abduction, and a shooting. Here now is Ryan Cook reports. It all happened right here, 74 Springdale Street, a house that's well known in this area by neighbors and police for several violent incidents in the past. Now the details of a shooting last January became public this week. January 30th, 2017, 19-year-old Rebecca Murphy sent several sexual text messages to a 21-year-old man. She invited him here, where she was living in one of the apartments with her 16-year-old boyfriend. They lured him to a neighboring apartment belonging to Harold Noftel and Mabel Stanley. The four of them tried to saran wrap the victim to a chair. In the struggle, he managed to call 911. Now, it's unclear exactly what happened, but police have said they responded to the call but left the scene. Moments later, the 21-year-old man broke free and made a run for it. The 16-year-old, who we cannot identify due to a publication ban, fired one shot from a sawed-off shotgun. He struck the victim in the backside and fractured his femur. Noftal has admitted to kicking the victim and pistol whipping him three or four times with a pellet gun. Stanley then called 911 and told police a drive-by shooting victim had showed up on her doorstep. When police returned on February 5th to arrest her, she said she was surprised it took them that long. The four were initially charged with attempted murder. That charge was changed to aggravated assault when they pleaded guilty. The Crown is asking for five to seven years for Noftal, four to six for Stanley. Defense is countered with a max of three years for both of them. Judge Mike Madden will render his decision on February 13th. Now the judges pondered why Noftal and Stanley would get involved in the love lives of young adults. Due to their guilty pleas, there will be no trial, so that answer may never come out. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. The provincial government is about to get involved in a national program aimed at getting help for people who are suicidal. Concerns were raised last summer about the number of suicides happening in Grand Bank, six in little more than a year. But in the fall, two sisters went public with their heartbreaking story on Here and Now. The husbands of Valerie Peach and Natalie Randall both killed themselves within a three-month period in 2016. After that, the government announced it was increasing mental health services in the area. And now, on Monday, Premier Dwight Ball is going to the community to announce more help. The province is getting involved in a national community suicide prevention program called Roots of Hope. Now to Trout River on the northern peninsula. The small town that was floating in water Saturday is starting to rebuild. Here now's Colleen Connors was in Trout River today and got a closer look at the damage. This playground, road and parking lot were all underwater Saturday when temperatures dropped and the melted snow had nowhere to go. Trout River is now a big construction scene as truck after truck of fill shows up trying to replace the land that washed away. And we got to the point where we were within inches of the school gymnasium here being undermined by the uh, floodwaters. And now you've had crews working around the clock. You guys haven't stopped and you have this new embankment. So the, is there a secure school here now? Yes, we've been uh, told that now our school is in a much more secure situation and that uh, they're working now at the front to try and make preparations to get school reopened here. The land is safer now. Jakeman All Grade will open to the 80 or so students Monday. Operators still have to reroute the river stream of deep water so the land doesn't give way again. Crews have not stopped filling in land and securing the main bridge structure since the flood. There is much, very much, I think, a feeling of cooperation here in town throughout this whole process. We've seen an uh, overwhelming amount of people. What can we do? Can we bring food? Can we help? Uh, we've pulled in uh, every piece of heavy equipment and machinery that I think is available to us. We've pulled it in. They've been more than willing to come at a moment's notice. Engineers are keeping a close eye on this house and the uneven land behind it. This area is known to landslides and people here are under a precautionary evacuation. So therefore, we're dealing with that now, and hopefully everybody will be back in the residence by this evening. The mayor says many homes have flood damage, sewage issues, and a lot of cleanup ahead of them come the spring. But the worst of this flood and storm damage is over. Today, uh, people are being more relieved than they have been in the past week. The water level is going down, and the equipment is on site. Make repairs wherever we can, and 
uh, all, all in all, it's starting to settle down. Even the state of emergency has been lifted here. I think it's safe to say that the urgency and the fear has left this town. And now it's just a matter of cleaning up and bringing things back to the way they were, getting that school back up and running, getting that bridge secure. And hopefully people living here can have a life and go back to normal really soon. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Trout River. Well, the river's still twice its normal size. The situation on one street in Deer Lake is getting worse. More land gave way overnight on Pine Tree Drive. It's been eroding ever since the weekend when high water levels and ice scoured away the sandbanks. Since then, parts of the bank have been giving way. Two homeowners have agreed to leave. The mayor worries about what will happen when the weather warms up and the frost is no longer there to hold the sand together. All right, obviously it's been quite the weather week. Yeah. Heading into the weekend. Yeah, we, and we do know that snow is coming, but uh, it's also the time of the year when there's a whole lot of parents out there hitting the road with their kids who are just uh, yeah. crazy yeah. about hockey. Yeah, that's right. Hockey, lots of tournaments and games underway, and of course, Hockey Day in Canada uh -huh. is tomorrow in Cornerbrook. And you know, it's nice yeah. after this crazy week in the West Coast that uh, some festivities can happen there and hopefully uh, uh, give everyone else uh, something else to think about. Let's uh, give you a look at that forecast. Of course, it's the big day. The whole country is going to be watching. And, well, it will be snowing. A pretty wintry day set for Cornerbrook and the West Coast tomorrow. Snow begins in the morning, about 2 to 5 centimeters on the way. And 3 to 8 centimeters... Again, five or a little less, a little more as we work into the afternoon and a trace to two centimeters. Add it all up from basically morning into the evening hours, 10 to as much as 15 centimeters in Cornerbrook. So those who are uh, definitely keeping an eye on the rinks tomorrow, outdoor rinks in Cornerbrook are definitely going to have to have the shovels uh, going back and forth and keeping things cleared off. But some pretty good news is that... Uh, it's a nice start and pretty quiet for tomorrow evening when, of course, Hockey Night in Canada and the, the Leafs take on the Sens, Anthony. And now as we uh, take a look at your Saturday timeline, note that those uh, that snow is going to be rolling in in the morning to Cornerbrook. Central Newfoundland gets into the action late morning into the noon hour time period. And St. John's and the Avalon not until the late afternoon. And note that for here across the Avalon and the Buren, we will change to some rain and drizzle tomorrow for Saturday evening if you are headed out. Enough to just uh, make it a little bit heavier to shovel by the time we get to Sunday morning. Not quite as much here, 2 to 5 centimeters, generally 5 to 10 for most, but looking at 10 to as much as 15 for the West Coast by, uh, uh, through Saturday evening. And uh, for you folks in Labrador, again, looking generally quiet with just a few flurries. We'll break down your complete weekend timeline and your forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Anthony? All right, we'll talk Leaf Sens later, Mr. Snodden. It's been an exciting week for Paralympic gold medalist Katarina Roxon. She has been selected to represent Canada in an international swimming competition, and she will soon receive the province's highest honour. Here now's Carolyn Stokes has more. It's been a big week. <laughs> it's, uh, it's exciting. Paralympic gold medalist Katarina Roxon got a double shot of good news. Once again, she has been chosen to compete in the Commonwealth Games in Australia this April. It'll be my third games. Uh, I'm going in as a veteran this time and it's we have a huge team. A team of 11 has been selected and the 24-year-old says she's not just the veteran this time, she's also the elder. I'm pretty much the grandma of the team. Everyone, like especially the younger, the girls, they uh, they kind of call me mom. <laughs> so it's, I'm like, they come to me and talk to me and it's really nice. Roxon just returned from an endurance training camp in Trinidad, but her favorite place to train is at home on the West Coast. That's where she'll spend the next few months getting ready for the games. It's the atmosphere and the people and... The fact that it's home, home is you feel you're most comfortable and uh, being surrounded by all the people here, especially in Stephenville is so phenomenal and they're very supportive and like everybody on this island, they're, everyone's so supportive. And she'll soon feel more of that support. Later this month, Roxon will be invested into the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador. It's huge. It's the highest honor any Newfoundlander or Labradorian can get. Um, for me, to be able to get this at 24 years old, I'm 
it's I'm so honored and blessed. She's a Paralympic gold medalist. She has a street named after her, and she will receive the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador. It's an impressive list of accomplishments. So what is her next goal? Hopefully getting a medal in Commonwealth Games. That's that's my next goal right now. Tackling the task at hand with a view to competing in the World Championships in 2019. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. Wow. What an ambassador yeah. she is for this yeah. province. Incredible. I can yeah. just see the toothpaste companies phoning our house. <laughs> we have an endorsement. Give us a call. <laughs> Fabulous smile. Go for it. <laughs> I can't exaggerate the threat that this collective agreement is to your polity, to the taxpayers of Newfoundland. No mincing words here. A Toronto labour expert lambastes the province's deal with NAEP. NAEP's unprecedented news conference today was provoked in part by a letter to the Board of Trade from Toronto lawyer Howard Levitt. The labor relations lawyer was asked by the business group to review NAEP's tentative deal with government and to say Levitt slammed the deal is an understatement. We've reached Howard Levitt in Toronto. Well, Mr. Levitt, NAEP came out with guns blazing today attacking business and their so-called experts, of which you would be one. What do you make of Nate's response? Well, I guess it's interesting to be called a so-called expert, but in any event, putting that moment aside, 
it's unbelievable how the government appears to have cratered and capitulated to the most outrageous set of demands I've ever even heard of in 40 years practicing labor law across this country. But if they wanted to bankrupt the province of Newfoundland, I can't imagine what they could have asked for that would have done a better job of doing that than what they seemed to have agree had agreed to. Okay, well, let's look at the specifics of the deal. First of all, the no layoff clause, which Nate says is just for this contract. You don't buy that, do you? Well, it's, it's simply a lie. It's in the contract. So the company, the government in this case, has to negotiate it out of the contract. Otherwise, it stays in the contract. And what self-respecting union would ever agree to take that out of the contract? And if they did take it out of the contract, the members would hang them. They will never get out of the contract without a very, very, very long strike. So if they were serious about that, what they do is put into a memorandum of understanding just for this agreement. It would still be outrageous. It would still cause lenders not to lend to the government of Newfoundland, which needs the, the loans. But at least it would only be for this contract. So let them put their money where their mouth is and put it in on that context. Hmm. Well, another item, of course, is severance. What is your view of government paying out millions in lump sum pay some payments to make severance just go away? I did not know that the government of Newfoundland was this flush with cash and it's this big a surplus that it could afford to do that. The problem with it is, is not only are they giving severance in advance, but the people get to keep the severance if they're never fired. If they resign, if they retire, if they're fired for cause, they've already got their severance. And also, I understand NAEP has admitted, this isn't going to ask, prevent them from asking for even more severance down the line. Now, you call this severance payout a gratuitous, a gratuitous rather, gift. NAEP says it's money that these people have earned. Why, why the difference between you two? Well, because it is gratuitous. Severance is for being fired. When someone's fired, they get severance. It's as simple as that. Everybody, every Newfoundlander knows that. You get termination pay when you're terminated. They haven't been terminated, so therefore they're not entitled to severance pay. It's a purely gratuitous gift that they might never become entitled to. Well, I think, uh, I think people, some people would strongly disagree with that because people do receive severance when they retire. Um, it, it happens here at the CBC and other places. Well, that's unusual. In private industry, you don't get severance for a voluntary retirement. You don't get severance when you resign. Severance legally, in any context, is for being severed, for being involuntarily fired. That's what severance is for, for being laid off or fired, not for voluntarily resigning. And by the way, when anyone in other provinces has ever received severance pay for resigning, it's always been a scandal when it involves public, public money. I just wonder your thoughts on the fact that Ottawa paid out severance to its civil servants about five years ago. So did our provincial police force, the RNC. So there is a precedent for this kind of thing. Well, I've personally not seen it, but all I can say is if there's a boondoggle in one place, doesn't entitle every government to give boondoggles wherever they are. It's still a waste of money because there's no legal entitlement to that. Government and if the government of Newfoundland's already in some financial difficulty, why are you exacerbating the problem, making it even worse? Well, with government financial difficulty, they say that um, this will take a big liability off their books, which will look good to lenders. What do you think? It's exactly the opposite. There's only a liability when they sever someone. Some employees leave without being severed. So they're creating a liability for everybody where none will exist for many of these employees. Mm -hmm. It's simply nonsensical for them to take that position. It, it belies reason and common sense. NAEP is arguing they have made concessions in this contract, Mr. Levitt, uh, particularly with the four-year wage freeze which saves government money. What do you think? Well, I think the 1% to 2% increase that most co collective agreements provide, they're giving that up. But I'd, if I were the governor of Newfoundland, I'd sooner give them 10% a year than agree to no wage cuts because it's, it's more dangerous to have, uh, sorry, I mean no, no, um, no layoffs because that is far more dangerous than higher wage increases. Keeping on employees you don't really need is very serious. And if you're a lender to the province of Newfoundland, you're going to say to yourself, if they're that fiscally reckless, if that beholden to the union movement, if they can't manage their finances by letting people go when they need to let people go, that's too irresponsible a government to ever loan money to. 
And just finally, uh, your rebuttal to this comment from the union that uh, concerns like yours are unnecessarily inflammatory and fear-mongering at the very worst. Well, what is, uh, you can't, I can't exaggerate the threat that this collective agreement is to your polity, to the taxpayers of Newfoundland. It's really, the union's delighted to get it. I've never heard of anyone else getting it, private or public sector. There's no layoff ever clause. And of course, they're going to make whatever hysterical arguments they want to, to try and preserve it, because no one gets a lifeline like this. Why should public sector workers get guaranteed jobs for life and severance pay in advance paid for by private sector citizens who are already overburdened and will never get benefits like that? It just isn't fair and it's not equitable. And if I have to tell people that for the, to, to stop it, that I'm doing a favor to the citizens of Newfoundland. Howard Levitt, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Well, Finance Minister Tom Osborne isn't having any of what Howard Leverett just explained to Debbie. Just hours ago, he told reporters in St. John's it's unusual for the government to speak out while a labour contract is being ratified, but he says it's critical to combat the fear-mongering from the St. John's Board of Trade. We've had two mega projects come to a close in this province. We've got unemployment numbers that are higher than any other province. We've got a third mega project coming to a close in this province being Muskrat Falls over the, over the next year or so. That's, that's winding down. We've got Fort McMurray where we've had hundreds of people in this province bringing home huge salaries and that's no longer the case. We cannot afford to have fear in our public service that there will be mass layoffs we cannot afford to have people wondering who's next and not spend. We've seen that pattern in the past when people knew through budget announcements we're going to lay off 400 people. Retail sales numbers show that people stop spending because they don't know who's next. We can't afford as a province, our economy, to have that uncertainty. But what we can do is have the certainty that with an aging population, we can achieve what we need to achieve through attrition. Through an aging workforce, we can achieve attrition numbers that we need to achieve. We don't need to put fear in real families where they don't buy cars, they don't buy sofas, they don't shop, they don't go out to dinner. That's what we don't need. How to make a better pizza? Just ask Facebook. I'm, like, I'm only one man, I'm making the pizzas.
hello. When it's not fit out, I like to hove off. For me, it's a cup of tea, a good book. But for you, how do you hove off? Send us a video, a photo, or if you're really hove off, a few words will do. The best hove offers could win a CBC prize. Now, where was I? Excuse me, ma'am, is there something I can help you with? Uh. <laughs> still laughing. Osmond's furniture. They were surprised mm -hmm. to see Heather Barrett there. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so before we get to the weather, I want to ask you, how do you like your pizza? Loaded. Uh, lots of meat. Can't get enough meat, like piles of meat. I thought you were pizza. talking about the condition you were in. Yeah. The pizza. Okay, but you like want everything well, on it, right? You want everything on it. That's right. Big on the meat, veggies, everything? Uh, yeah, I like a good amount of veggies too. Yeah, you can't really put too many toppings on a pizza in my, in my opinion. All what right. about you guys? So stacked. Well, we're leading to something here because if you love pizza, the chances are you're definitely not the only one out there. There's a Facebook group that's dedicated to pizza lovers in the St. John's area, and it's so hot right now that some pizza places uh, can't keep up. That's right. The owner of one particular pizza place, Kilbride Pizza, used feedback posted in the group to improve his recipe, and it worked. And now Moody, as he's affectionately known, can barely keep up with the demand for his delicious dish. Been amazing. Like if he, as you see, the phone doesn't stop off the hook, and it's just I don't have nothing to give now. Like I don't, I open at three o'clock. Uh, I changed my, my, uh, my times, uh, my sign, like we open from 11 to 11. Now I change all my hours to 3.10 uh, because I, I have to do a prep work in the morning. And uh, I, like, I'm only one man, I'm making the pizzas and we only got two ovens. Uh, we're cooking as fast as we can. Nice. Getting hungry. That, that first one looked like it's made for him, right? Made for you. Yeah. Lots of meat, lots of cheese. I love it. Uh, great day for bunkering down and uh, grabbing some pizza uh, tomorrow, uh, any kind of some snacks. And, of course, Hockey Day in Canada is yeah. on most of the day on CBC. And have a look uh, why it's a great day to hunker down will be the snow because we've got some snow coming in across uh, most of the island for tomorrow. Southern Labrador getting clipped with some of this as well with a trace to as much as 5 centimetres. Heaviest amounts will be along the west coast, 10 to 15 centimetres uh, through Saturday evening along the west coast of the island, southwest coast could get into the, some of those 10 plus centimeter amounts. I think 5 to 10 centimeters for most of central and 2 to 5 centimeters with a mix to some rain and drizzle through Saturday evening across the Buren and the Avalon Peninsula. Special weather statements are in effect for western Newfoundland because not only with the snow on Saturday, but we're going to be seeing some onshore flurries and squalls developing on Saturday night in through Sunday as well and that could add up to more than 20 centimeters in some spots by the time we get through into about Sunday afternoon. So uh, again, the potential for uh, some higher snowfalls there and Environment Canada giving everyone the heads up, especially uh, with uh, so much going on in Cornerbrook. Boy, uh, don't think that I wasn't refreshing the radar a few times today as this system just edged close to the Avalon today. At times it looked like it was gonna back right in. This was supposed to be well offshore, uh, not so much, but thankfully no big impacts on the Avalon today as that low uh, rolls just, just to our east. Uh, now, the next low that will be having an impact is, of course, this Alberta Clipper, which is moving in as we move over the next 12 to 24 hours, bringing us the snowfall. Watch the radar here and the satellite, uh, in uh, should say the future tracker that it does bring some of those uh, flurries into uh, Labrador City minus 30 uh, for overnight lows uh, rising a little bit before morning, but we are going to be seeing some flurries on the go there. Everybody else, it's a quiet start even in Cornerbrook at minus 10 and then watch your timeline here. The snow pushes in for the afternoon. There's 2 p.m. and starting to push into central parts of Newfoundland at this point. Still quiet across the Avalon, so pretty good travel day uh, for the eastern half of the island for the early going. And then that snow will then track in through the afternoon into the evening hours, uh, ramping up. Again, no, not crazy heavy snowfall here, uh, maybe a centimeter or two per hour at the very heaviest snowfall rates. And we are going to be seeing uh, 
as we roll into the later parts of the day, some of that uh, those temperatures rising up closer to the freezing mark along the south coast. Minus two in St. John's. Highs of minus 20 for Happy Valley, Goose Bay and Labrador City again with a possibility of a few centimeters. Note the winds will be picking up for Cornerbrook in the west coast. Gusts near 60 generally. Uh, right along exposed areas of the coast could see some gusts closer to 70 and a bit of some blowing snow into the later parts of the afternoon and evening as, as uh, those winds will then shift to the west. Again, for the Buren and the Avalon, that brief change over to some rain and drizzle through Saturday evening, but by Sunday morning, the cooler air is moving back in. There are those onshore flurries and snow squalls for Sunday. The big theme for Sunday is that these temperatures are going to be Stalling or falling, we're pretty much steady near minus eight, nine in Cornerbrook and St. Anthony in the Straits falling a couple of degrees. St. John's will fall to about minus five into the afternoon. Central falling to about minus seven or eight. So uh, breezy and cool and even Labrador, a pretty cool day. Happy Valley Goose Bay likely dropping by a degree or two as well. We'll talk more about your long range forecast. Another warm up next week for the island. The details are coming up, Debbie. King Muskrat right. Students in Riddle take their protest to the stage. Welcome back to Here and Now. A different look now at Muskrat Falls. There's no denying it's a project that generates a fair bit of debate, to say the least. But most of those views on the project come from either adults who say the project is a smart move or others who say it's going to spell the death of Newfoundland and Labrador. So that's why it caught our attention when a short documentary was released this week about a group of students in Labrador sharing their views on the development. And the students at Northern Lights Academy in Rigolette have done it in an unusual way through a play they wrote and performed called This Isn't Right. The play was initially done for the Labrador Creative Arts Festival, but the documentary is giving it a wider audience. Take a look. They are putting our health at risk. This will change our lives forever. They are creating a public health hazard. They are refusing... Excuse me, what's going on here? Um, this is a protest? For what?
I was really, really proud of them for picking such a, a hard topic. Because for one thing, some of the youth in town, they feel like they don't have a voice. So I was proud of them for picking something that would have an impact on the audience they were going to show it to. I really enjoyed it and I thought it was powerful. I was excited. I was scared to perform it, but I had really, I had a lot of fun. I hurried up and learned my lines and it was a really fun trip. Every year we get a theme to write the play and this year's theme was resilience. Hello. Hi. I just got back from this presentation. And before you say anything, yes, I know that you told me not to get involved, but I think this is important. They all went away and started reading CBC articles and just talking to their own family members, and they started to realize how it would actually impact them. And once they started realizing that people were listening to their message, they started to become more proud of their topic. It was amazing. Everybody seemed to love it. I think the protest scenes cause it just showed how they are in real life and how powerful a lot of people coming together can be. That was so emotional, it was powerful, and it really moved me, stuff like that. I, I got a couple hugs because it made, it, it made people cry and they just felt how powerful it was. The food prices here are really high, like the things we need like ground beef and chicken and all that is really high so we can get wildlife whenever we want and it'll be free. And if we can't do that because of methylmercury then we might need to relocate or something. I would hope that someone who saw this play would walk away thinking about what it means for us to live here with this issue that means so much to us. You know, Anthony, no matter what the topic, that's a controversial one for many people, but yeah. what I found interesting is to see young students like that so engaged. Yeah. It's great. Getting involved, it's great to see. It was an ordinary Canadian fisherman who did an extraordinary deed. The Prime Minister pays tribute to Captain Gus Dalton.
Time to meet our young athlete of the day. This is Braden Lane of South River. Braden is five and plays hockey with the Bay Arena Rovers in the squirts division. Braden uh, hates to leave the ice when the time is up and he looks forward to every single hockey practice. Way to go, Braden. You're today's young athlete of the day. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's. Helping the world hear better. The eve of the weekend. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we've been watching all week the south of the U.S. Snow in mm. Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and Florida. Uh, things are starting to level off there. Uh, you folks that, of course, are watching us in Florida uh, on uh, satellite and online, I know we always love to hear from you. Back to 18 in Orlando this afternoon, and uh, so goes uh, the uh, friendly competition that was between uh, Florida and Newfoundland for uh, uh, overnight lows for parts of this week. And you can see back into the teens across southern parts of the U.S. Uh, even most of uh, Western Canada is seeing a bit of a warm up here as a bit of a Chinook pushes in on the other side of this clipper system that is now pushing into our neck of the woods. This low here, that's going to be our midweek warm up. And it does look like a warm up for central and eastern Newfoundland in particular. First, we've got that clipper system that does move in through the day on Saturday. It's gone by Sunday morning, though we will continue to see some onshore flurries for the west coast. But through Saturday evening, this is what we're looking at. Generally 10 to 15 centimeters along that west coast. Again, 2 to 5 for the Avalon, the Buren with that mix over to some rain. Uh, through that Saturday evening time period, much of central getting into that five to 10 centimeter range. And there again through Saturday evening is that warm up for the Buren and the Avalon. And there is that wraparound cool northwesterly wind, which does get those onshore flurries uh, going through the especially Saturday night in through Sunday time period, uh, starting to ease off a little bit as we roll through the Sunday evening and overnight. But continuing to be in the mix and uh, not quite as intense, but if you are traveling on Monday, be mindful that we will continue to see some of those onshore flurries. Now this area of high pressure comes through, kind of shuts things down for Tuesday. That's a quiet day. And then watch this. This uh, the forecast models continue to show the western track with this system right up through the Gulf. And so that means that we've got another warm up, especially eastern Newfoundland central. But I think western Newfoundland will likely rise above zero for a time on Wednesday with snow changing to ice and rain. And this is all snow and wind for Labrador. Onshore flurries wrap back in and temperatures will fall for the Thursday Friday time period, but not before that warm up. And there is your three, four, five degree temperatures, perhaps a little bit warmer than that in the east, but uh, we'll obviously keep you posted on that over the next couple of days. Temperatures really bottoming out for Monday. I'll uh, direct your attention there. Uh, minus nine or 10 for Western Newfoundland on Monday. Uh, rebounding again midweek and then the cool down in behind that midweek system. For you folks in Labrador, we're looking at temperatures uh, pretty chilly in the west, uh, riding the uh, cooler than seasonal, in fact, both in Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador City, with the best chance of snow certainly looking set for mid next week. Well, the uh, Prime Minister has paid tribute to Gus Dalton. He, of course, is the Newfoundland fishing captain who died this week. Dalton made international headlines back in 1986 when he discovered and helped save more than 150 Tamil refugees after he found them drifting in open lifeboats six miles off St. Shots. Yeah, it was quite the story. Dalton mm -hmm. took some of them aboard his longliner and then he called on the Coast Guard to rescue the others. Gus Dalton died Tuesday. He was 87 years of age. Now, the next evening, Justin Trudeau acknowledged Dalton's actions when the Prime Minister spoke in Scarborough at the Tamil Heritage Month celebrations. A great example of exactly that, of reaching out to different communities, of being a good neighbour, of working to build a better world, as everyone in this room knows, was Captain Gus Dalton. He was an ordinary Canadian fisherman who did an extraordinary deed, rescuing 155 Tamils off the shores of St. Schatz, Newfoundland. It's a sad day for all of us today, because as you know, Gus passed away last night, but many in this room, including those who actually came off the boat on August 11th, 1986, as well as their children, are the legacy that Gus leaves behind, a legacy 
that helped build this community. This year, Captain Dalton was set to receive the Meritorious Service Medal from the Governor General, but I know that the Tamil community carved out a special place in their hearts for Gus a long time ago. Well, this mm. is a, certainly an interesting weather picture, uh, one that uh, uh, I think will hit home for many, and we'll tease it with uh, peas pudding hot, peas pudding <laughs> cold. Uh, but uh, what can I give for a clue? Northern Newfoundland uh, along the north coast, uh, somewhere along the Beaver Peninsula. I'll even narrow it in there. If you can name the community, though, extra bonus points, and we'll tell you where after the break. A couple of close calls that we want to tell you about tonight. Really close. And the first one happened on Oregon's Columbia River. Hey! 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 Oh my God! Oh my heaven! Oh. Three people fishing for salmon, of course, as you can see, frantically trying to get the attention of an approaching 31-foot motorboat, but no dice. No, the incident, which happened over the summer, was captured on a GoPro camera. It's taken a while for the video to come out, though, because the motorboat driver is now facing a lawsuit to go along with his criminal charges. Fishermen say they've suffered hypothermia and psychological tra trauma, but clearly this could have been far worse. Much worse. Oh. It's amazing they actually make the jump at the right time to get far enough away not to get seriously injured I know, because they killed. didn't jump until the last seconds. Whoa. <sighs> wow. Unbelievable. Okay, here's the other video. Strong winds in Germany made for some dangerous conditions at airports. You can bet tensions were running high in the cockpit of that plane coming in for a landing at the Dusseldorf Airport. The Eurowings aircraft was struggling as it was descending in strong mm, crust winds. Yeah, I wouldn't want that sideways motion. It was launched, it was landing rather during hurricane strength winds in Germany. Luckily, the skilled pilot managed to pull through and land that aircraft without a hitch a little bit of good weather there <laughs> i love the rainbow at the end <laughs> nice touch yeah that's right <laughs> wow it's yeah. impressive yeah so you want to tell people what's next it's absolutely time now to see who is celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week 
Happy 50th wedding anniversary today to Paul and Iris Parsons. They're from Bombay and now live in Brampton, Ontario. Happy birthday to Max Kirby, who will be 95 on Sunday. Happy 91st birthday to Lou Anderson, who now lives in Bowmanville, Ontario. Happy 58th anniversary to Philip and Helen Buckle of English Point Forteau, Labrador. Happy 55th wedding anniversary greetings to Marguerite and Mark Avery of Long Beach, Trinity Bay. Happy 53rd anniversary to Tom and Ivy Stockley in St. John's. And congratulations to William and Hattie Butt in Grand Bank who celebrated their 61st wedding anniversary on Monday. A happy 100th birthday tomorrow to Alva Rideout in Cornerbrook. Happy 90th birthday today to Mae Ricketts of New West Valley. Happy 51st anniversary to Clarice and Doug Robbins from Bonavista. They celebrated on Tuesday. Happy 99th birthday tomorrow to Ned Abbott of Musgrave Harbor. Looks like a bit of Jigs dinner there on the table. And congratulations to Millicent and Lincoln Mercer of Spaniards Bay celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Happy 90th birthday to Alice Quigley in Grand Falls, Windsor. Her big day is on Monday. Dougold and Phyllis Knoll of Stephenville celebrate their 56th anniversary tomorrow. Congratulations to Ken and Phyllis Roberts of Forto who celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary on the 16th. Birthday greetings to Mary Chasson, who will be 94 next Wednesday. Originally from Millertown, Mary now calls Porta Basque home. Happy 93rd birthday greetings going out to Florence Lindstead of Lancelou. Birthday greetings to Elizabeth Lewis from Baytona, who turned 90 this past Tuesday. Happy 100th birthday to Molly West, originally from Ladle Cove. She celebrated her big birthday on Tuesday, January 9th. Congratulations to Bill and Alma Rose in Marystown. They celebrate their 75th wedding anniversary today. Walter and Gladys Osmond from Porta Bass celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary yesterday. And a happy 93rd birthday yesterday as well to Harris Mercer. And a happy 92nd birthday next Monday to Millicent Garland, who celebrates her birthday on Monday. Originally from Monroe, Millicent now lives in Clarenville. And a happy 90th birthday yesterday to Walter Chaffee from Musgrave Town. Jean Stick from St. John's turns 91 this Sunday. Congratulations. Happy 94th birthday this coming Monday to British war bride Marion Piercy, originally from Edinburgh, Scotland. She now lives in paradise. Happy birthday to Gertrude Maloney, who is celebrating her 105th birthday today. Gertrude is formerly from Tickle Cove, Bonavista Bay, and now lives in St. John's. Happy 52nd wedding anniversary to Maurice and Yvonne Wilcott of St. Albans. On Tuesday, Helen and Bob Simmons celebrated 58 years of marriage. Congratulations. Happy 60th anniversary to Clarence, Bud, and Joy Squires of Deer Lake. Their golden wedding anniversary was this Tuesday. Happy 57th anniversary to Maisie and Jeffrey Noseworthy of Botwood. And congratulations to Austin and Edith Patey from River of Ponds. They celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary last Sunday. Linda and Roy Tucker of Carpoon celebrated their 50th anniversary on December 22nd with family and friends. And a happy birthday to Ted Patey in St. Anthony who celebrated his 92nd birthday yesterday. And this Monday, Stephen and Myrtle Gregory who now live in paradise will celebrate their 54th wedding anniversary. So well, congratulations everybody. Nice. Of course. Okay, our viewer picture of the day. Uh, any guesses along the Bayvert Peninsula? A beautiful uh, no. shot. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty tough one, but... Uh, Pudding Cove. <laughs> nice. Uh, Burlington. Uh, oh. Yes. Beautiful Burlington and... Is that uh, Sean Majumder's dirty is, old pudding it bag? It is, it is. I've got it back on the map for him. How many uh, times has he used it, Debbie? Yeah, uh, It looks very well used <laughs> peas pudding bag there. Uh, and nice shot. A beautiful you know, shot there from Raquel Burton. Why not keep Burton. using it? Definitely. <laughs> a little bit of frost in the bag there. Just a beautiful shot. Okay. Very nice. Thanks very much for sending along the picture. Thanks to all of you for being with us this week. See you Monday. Good night.